Our next speaker, Raven Renee Ray, is currently a gra graduate candidate in psychology at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, focusing on developing medical protocols for no. ayahuasca treatment centers. Raven's role includes connecting therapists with seeker, seekers, in multi, seekers multinationally by developing an online referral system, growing a volunteer network of trained graduate psychology students to offer 24-hour support so through use of a web forum, me. and putting together a board of advisors. So head, head injury in between things, and it is really have a hard time on time. You're on. <laughs> Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Thank you for joining me here today for this short speech that I really feel needs a lot more time than we have here today. So we'll just get started. My name is Raven Ray. I'm coming to you from the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, where MDMA research actually began again. I provided everyone with one of these bright green handouts at the back of the room there. And if you would, just make sure you get a copy before you leave. I think you'll find a lot of the information there valuable and interesting, and with a short time today. So I'm here to speak about ayahuasca treatment center safety for the Western Seeker. As we're moving through the speech, I ask that you not only use your intellect in understanding the issues at hand, but try checking in with your gut and your heart and searching for your own intuition and perspective concerning the practice and how we might be able to collectively help all involved, from sinners to seekers, researchers to other per others professionally invested in this topic. What is the best path forward? With all the open minds here at this conference, I know this is possible. It only requires perspective, allowing that perspective, and letting go of fear. So I began this research after a trip down to Iquitos, Peru in early 2012, where I'd been told by the old U.S. Ambassador, um, Gerald Moreau, that five people had died during the month that I was there. He said that the shaman would just say, I don't know, they just went off walking in the, they went walking off in the jungle, maybe an anaconda ate them, and then they'd bury the bodies. This was hearsay then, but upon return, uh, several months later, uh, we learned of Kyle Nolan's death, which hit the press hard. Um, and so then that really let me know that, you know, something's actually happening here, and I got really more involved. Um, it was a strikingly similar story to what, to what I've heard, um, that the shaman said Kyle had walked off into the jungle, that he didn't know what happened, and uh, his body was found soon, buried in a shallow grave on the center site. With encouragement from the Citadel, I decided to work to delineate risks in the attempt to save the practice or to help save the practice from increasing stigma as well as to help those who many times are seeking healing and are vulnerable in this space. The theory was that we were simply missing education and communication for seekers and sinners. What I saw as an easy fix back then. <laughs> In 2012, I began the research just after learning of Nolan's death. I decided to begin with a basic content analysis of the information contained on 18 ayahuasca, uh, Iquitos ayahuasca center websites. Um, what I noticed there was overwhelmingly uh, the benefits are mentioned on all sites, um, but only a third of those centers reported any risk at all. Um, no center reported the real risk of psychosis and then, or there's, you know, maybe no awareness there. And then um, one center did report that, you know, you could die um, as a risk. So from there, uh, I decided to dig a bit deeper and I sent out this ayahuasca treatment center safety questionnaire um, to 65 centers in and around Iquitos, Peru 
And I was surprised, actually, at the response rate. Uh, I guess this is a pretty good response rate. Uh, 25% actually responded. Um, there were many that just flipped through, but um, it's really appreciative that people actually here to help with the understanding. So from here, we're not only able to see a variety of results, but, oh, excuse me, let me step back for a moment. Okay, so there were 19 questions on this test, which will be available after the conference on my website, um, the aftercareproject.org on those handouts. And um, so we're going to focus on this question for today in time. <laughs> How do you determine if a client is ready for this type of treatment? So uh, respondent number five, in a ceremony with ayahuasca, such information is revealed. No one is ever ready, respondent two. Only the client knows if he or she is ready for the treatment. And then here are a few more responses here, um, just to give you an overall idea. Um, so we not only see, again, <laughs> that there's a variety of responses and, um, and that there's a lack of consensus really concerning safety practices in this context. Um, and this was all the way through to the end of 2014 that they were responding. And it's still open, but uh, so what, yeah, let's see. But it was about understanding why some people are getting hurt and the best informed safety practices for seekers and sinners. Through the literature review involved in writing this paper, I concluded that we again needed education and communication with outreach. As I was finishing the paper, I was learning of others returning in need of help after. So I concluded we could help by providing access to support with integrative therapists and counselors and due to the stigma in a secured confidential space for all involved. So the need literally did come knocking at my door. They meet Tim here, social worker. Um, he showed up at my place of work um, unexpectedly, uh, just through the research that I had been doing. Um, he was really needing help, and uh, he'd gone to this treatment center, one of the most popular centers, um, and he had gone down for help with social anxiety and came back in worse condition than um, when he had arrived. And his main concern was that he had no one to talk to. Um, but beyond that, I did a little light probing, and uh, it was interesting, just one thing out of many things, um, inconsistencies in what the centers reported online and what he experienced um, was that, you know, they asked for tips and gifts for the indigenous people um, beyond, like, the massive amount of money, you know, to attend the retreat. And he brought his gifts, and the next day uh, after he arrived, there was uh, this big argument and all this negative energy because the, all the gifts were stolen. So um, just imagine, I guess, showing up for, you know, you're just really maybe a little afraid to try with this powerful antigen, and then something like that happens. But, um, but he wasn't so concerned about that. He just really wanted help. Um, So the message I received then was really, yeah, we need a space for compassionate aftercare support. So I went to work hard on a vision to address this, one which I envisioned could be done through collective volunteer efforts and heart alone, and I still believe this, especially given the entheogenic nature of this medicine. On the topic of helping the collective to transcend, we're talking about transcending consciousness a lot here, I strongly believe it is the human spirit that has the power to affect this change. It only takes one person to foster hope so that this person can be in a better place to help others as well. If we could help someone like Tim, a social worker, currently still working at Goodwill now, to find his way again, I know that's what he wants, to be there for others, spoken to him, and as he had been prior. So that's the idea, like this butterfly effect. <laughs> Help each other out. But as time has gone on, I've realized it's much more complex than the need for aftercare support. So yeah, and due to the, there's so many more than what's listed here. <laughs> um, just going into risk factors. And um, I really worked hard to try to delineate the risk so that we could focus more on the benefits and just continue 
the research there and keep people safe. Um, but I mean, it's a new paradigm. We're still learning in this space. The cultural differences are major. You know, Westerners are expecting a certain thing when they come, um, like, you know, uh, legal support if something happens. Say a woman gets raped at a center in Peru. She's, you know, they ask her basically to just sign a paper and nothing really happens. Um, then if someone dies at a Peruvian-based center, and I'm not meaning to just pick out Peru, this is just what I'm aware of, <laughs> it is highly unlikely there will be any prosecution, not so much due to laws perhaps, as the fear of retribution from the shaman, as well as an environment which sustains itself on corrupt practices. Which is sad, actually, for centers that are trying to do good things. I, I believe they, there are those. Um, motivations, I think, are very important, perhaps the most important, especially as I refer to these in the context of those providing the information concerning treatment, treatment at these centers. From the centers to media outlets, everyone. Are they motivated truly to heal? Really ask yourself, if you're going in to do this, what do they have to gain from your participation? What is of benefit here? Not only for centers, no but for all involved in the ayahuasca commerce, including those who may appear to have the best of intentions, dig deeper. Spiritual capitalism would fall under this category and it's quite pervasive. You'll find this in unexpected places. If only you ask those questions. Really much of this seems to come down to ayahuasca having become their breadwinner, so to say, as well as the ego's want of fame in this mysterious and enticing new arena. Spiritual capitalism here could be akin to that of the televangelist who says, you must plant the seed in order to prosper, meaning to get the money, of course. The sinner says you must do the work that you might require, and that you might require much more work than expected. Motivations are very important in deciding whether you're being used or if this is actually in your best interest. Expectations, I think, would be just as important um, as it's highly touted on various media outlets, including center sites or research. You know, in some ways, there's more balance there, but that there are life-changing benefits ayahuasca has to offer you, that you will know when she calls you. You might expect the center is going to focus on you, commiserate with payment, perhaps even, <laughs> and be sure that you receive the best of care. Maybe having been given a ton of paperwork to fill out and many informed consent, and many, excuse me, many promises and joyous exchanges, the paperwork often appears to be something like an informed consent document. However, this creates a false sense of security. Some are even expressing hurt after spending so much money and not receiving visions as they'd expected, they, they feel rejected and at a complete loss. Um, and I know the answer there from the shaman would be, you know, continue, and that's maybe actually true. It's still just about motivations and are they really looking to heal. So, um, and then vulnerability, um, it's very much related to this. Uh, many from all walks of life are going down for this treatment in the hopes of curing a wide range of ailments, um, from depression to cancer, all sorts of things, and likely as a last hope form of treatment. It tends to appear to be this magic potion, this quick fix, which we're so used to in our Western society. These people are often desperate in their search for healing and putting a lot of faith in this treatment that they've heard so many positive things about. They are also more vulnerable to physical and spiritual attack. And spiritual attack something we wouldn't understand so much from, you know, our Western perspective. But I believe it because it's not my area. Uh, rape and robbery, they're vulnerable to that under the influence of the medicine. The most vulnerable population, however, and the saddest, as I see it, are those with disabilities. In which they are likely lower on finances and really putting all into this treatment. Perhaps only to find, as one woman has shared that the center did not care so much to address her healing since she didn't have the money to tip the indigenous people. She happened to go to that same very popular center as the first social worker who'd reached out. Because of her lack of further funding, she was left out as reported not only by herself, but um, along with a few other participants who verified this. She was 
also in a remote location and had no help getting to the center, falling over and over on the way in. So a nice entrance, <laughs> strong woman. And all that paperwork they had her fill out, it seems was not read to her horror with all these conditions that she really, she put all in for this treatment. And they'd, it was, they'd ask the questions as if it was the first time and that they were hearing this, they hadn't seen the paperwork. And they had so many people at the center, um, dozens of others um, to keep up with. Yes, very strong woman, and I think you'll hear more from her soon. Her story is only one of many, which leads me to lack of transparency. How can we trust that we are promoting a good practice if we're unable to verify this? When something bad happens, the victim seems normally to be to blame, instead of the ability to safely discuss things openly within the community with the collective goal of helping to protect the people and the practice, including the centers themselves. Excuse me, guys. So false gurus, I definitely want to get that in here. So these can be found in many forms. On that bright green handout, you'll find a link to that false guru test. Please use it. It's very elucidating. <laughs> use this test not only for the gurus of the shamanic type, but for anyone who has any authority or power over your health and well-being. This also falls under spiritual capitalism. And there's this apparent risk that you might drink the tea and believe you're now a messiah, so another risk and effect for that person that might believe they're now a guru. Um, as far as individual differences, this is uh, also complex in and of itself. Um, one thing I'll say is there's a metabolic pathway that is uh, weakened in certain populations, and um, there are tests for that, but practically at the center, you know, it's not being offered, and then I'm not sure, you know, if that's able to be offered at the moment, but that's something that we could discuss and um, beyond that, you know, just personality differences, your temperament going in. Um, we're all wired differently, I think, you know. So um, you never really know when someone might go into a full-blown psychosis after, which is, you know, what's being reported from people reaching out for help. Or not as often, like, honestly, <laughs> as people looking for integration and help support that are just more lost. Um, and as far as, let's see, let's just at least hit on the admixtures. That beautiful flower there, toe. It can be very dangerous. I call it the anthrax of psychedelics because it only takes a very small amount to, you know, possibly put someone into a full-blown psychosis. It could be short-term or forever. It could put you into a coma. Death could also result. And then please, um, after the conference, you can check out the website under Help and Resources, and you'll see, uh, yeah, the complexity of the risks here. So here we see um, just one advertisement that is not indicative of it. It's not really a normal advertisement that I've seen for centers, um, usually not the direction that they come from. But this is Pulse Tours, advertising for life-changing adventures. And what they do um, is... As you can see here, there's a, they do within seven days, um, they have four authentic Shipibo ayahuasca ceremonies and one combo ceremony plus daily expert guided jungle, jungle excursions. So I'd be really curious about anyone that's attended a retreat, a retreat set up like this if they'd report that their life changing adventure tour was life-changing in a beneficial way and long-term. There's lots of promises here. <laughs> and you'll also notice there, um, excuse me, there's only one day left for any reflection. According to Adele Getty, uh, one of our spiritual uh, experts and others, integration is the most important aspect of the indigenous ceremony. I don't see any room for this. I see a lack of respect for the plant as well as for the concern of their participant safety. 
Okay, so this one I just had to bring up today because um, there's been some issues I see in the community on understanding and just, you know, um, people are getting hurt by the dialogue. So um, what is an ayahuasca-related death? It's just... It's any death that results from participation in an ayahuasca ceremony or simply associated with drinking ayahuasca. Did the ayahuasca kill them? No, it's a plant. For example, someone that is, you know, drinking and driving and they kill someone, was it the alcohol? No, it was, you know, the impact of the car, perhaps, or, you know, it wasn't, it was just alcohol related. Why is this important to understand and to keep into context here? So I'm going to give you an example, just one of many. Um, I've begun a list of ayahuasca-related deaths in the interest of informing ourselves for discussion, and we'll be sharing this soon. You'll find a lot more of this when you start typing in other languages, I notice. Um, today, I've chosen to highlight uh, Matthew Dawson Clark. As his family has most recently been unfairly re-victimized after they're still mourning the loss of their son. And this is something that is occurring on Facebook now. Matthew died after drinking the tobacco purge at Capitari. Another participant said Matthew had screamed louder than they'd ever heard a human scream. They'd even poisoned. To me, that sounds like he knew he was going to die. It's been reported this rumor that this rumor began that Matthew was a drug addict from the center itself. So this further. So the family is dealing with people coming up to them and saying, oh, it's so sad, you know, your son is, you know, is a drug addict, <laughs> and which wasn't true, and I, I believe it's not true, according to reports from families and family and friends. Um, and they're also not, you know, they're not trying to sue the center or anything like that. They're just trying to, they're very nice people. <laughs> they understand. So... Um, Let's see. This rumor was wholly unnecessary, and sadly, it's a result of, our, I think, of our conformist environment in which we're afraid to challenge the reigning notions currently that any death surrounding ayahuasca cannot be an ayahuasca-related death. The fear there of anything related to it rather than digging in and let's figure this out together. Like, what is happening here? I've seen people getting angry on social media saying this isn't an ayahuasca-related death. Why don't they say it was tobacco? I think it's actually useful to share the strong association with the ayahuasca ceremony. He trusted that center and he died. It's disturbing to see that the human life has somehow <laughs> become less important than the plant medicine as the plant's not going to die. Sadly, it appears to be only in the interest of quieting negative reports and fighting for personal use and other conflicts of interest. The real problem with thinking in this way is that we're missing the bigger picture. These reports will only continue unless we do something to help, unless we learn to have some compassion and step outside of ourselves and own interests. Secrets simply fester. Now is not the time for this. Not only a safety risk, there is the additional risk of our ability to study these plant medicines for possible cures. So this leads me to the need for further research. So what do we do? Um, well, yeah, we don't even know. How do we define healing in this context, short and long term? I'm concerned about those who are reaching out. I don't hear back often. And I really can't offer them anything more than the flowery platitudes, trust the process, try not to view it as good or bad, but on a path on your personal journey of healing, it's feeling more and more inauthentic. Then again, I don't want to further distress those reaching out. It's certainly bothersome, though, that we have to work so hard to try to cover for what's happened with the ayahuasca tourism boom and still feel the need to help. I don't think it's the fault of the seekers. I believe the marketing has been too great, and the desperation for healing makes for this dangerous mix in which those promoting should be aware of. So we need to shift the focus from promotion to harm reduction. Let's be honest, we're still defining the work that must be done in order to integrate the experience. But we're not really open about this. Instead, it sucks to see people again blaming the victim. You didn't do the work, so your fault. I hear this from, <laughs> and that's the implicit message. But what is it? <laughs> we're not there yet, we're just ahead of ourselves. So, con and then context is a real issue in the study and understanding of this form of treatment. I wonder if that work might actually work before taking the ayahuasca. What about the context of leaving the country and 
all the stresses behind to be in nature in the sunshine with good energy and with plenty of time to reflect on oneself and transform. There are so many unknowns and there are many plant medicines that those shamans can work with, you know, that are less risky. Um, the problem's already here to address. People are getting hurt and they need help, um, but it's difficult in a strange dichotomy with this most powerful entheogen up against spiritual capitalism and conflicts of interest in general. So what's the past path forward? I think we can learn from our collective use of psychedelics and what we've learned there. Perspective is everything. The psychedelic provides the perspective shift needed to gain wisdom and the useful insights to break out of the oddly conformist belief system in which there is a majority perspective followed. We must speak from outside of ourselves, from our hearts. Let go of fear. We need to let go, be courageous, authentic, and have integrity to face these challenges head on and importantly within the community. So it takes a community. This has become our responsibility, but also should be of interest to anyone concerned with a legal framework for the freedom to use psychedelics and the reduction of the associated stigma. There should be further oversight by those without conflicts of interest of the safety practices of these centers, and at least for the basic safety needs of Westerners. Uh, this would help in reducing challenges due to the current practices while there, but best inform the likely naive and vulnerable seeker um, in a way that they could actually understand how serious the practice is. We've teamed up with with uh, Tim Cools of Psychedelic Experience, and so happy to have met him and combine efforts here with the communal space he's been working so hard on to build for us. He's intelligent and honest, and you know I'm on the lookout for those motivations. Uh, he's very interested in collecting peer reviews for organizations for more informed use, uniting the community with ease of access to sister sites, promoting great causes, as well as collecting data to help further our understanding, which will help direct further research. Please join us at psychedelicexperience.net. Thank you. Um, and just, just a quick thing, the psychedelic renaissance is upon us. <laughs> it's amazing. And so we want to keep this trend. We want to make sure that this trend continues. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have time for questions. I'm sorry, but you don't have time for questions. Oh, okay.